The challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. When the boat from the States reached Dawson, an attractive girl of 21 stepped ashore and placed her suitcase on the dock. She looked around as if expecting someone to meet her. Presently, a bearded man with a weather-beaten face approached and touched his hat. Howdy, miss. Are you expecting to meet someone? Yes, I am. Are you Jake Bascom? That's me. You must be Miss Judith Clark. That's right. You, you wrote about my uncle's death. Yeah. Poor Jim, I, I was his right-hand man. I sure lost a friend when he was killed. I told you in the letter about his will, leaving you the gold mine. Yes. Well, it's upstream some distance to the claim. Our uh, canoe is waiting over yonder there. I'll carry you back. Thank you. The young fellow standing over there will help paddle. His name is Steve Martin. I see him. You uh, figure staying in the Yukon to run the mine? I don't know, Mr. Bascom, whether I'll run it or sell it. Well, your uncle put a lot of trust in me, Miss Judy. If you aim to stay, I can run things for you. Thank you for the offer. <laughs> Hi there. You must be Miss Clark. That's right. I'm Steve Martin. Yes, I know. Uh, I'll help you into the canoe. Thank you. <laughs> Easy there. Oh, steady. With Judy settled in the bottom of the canoe, Jake took the seat in the bow, while Steve Martin shoved off stepped into the rear seat and picked up a paddle. The two men paddled steadily without speaking. Steve Martin worked mechanically while his mind struggled to reach a decision. After half an hour, he leaned forward and spoke over Judy's shoulder. Miss Clark. What? I have something to tell you. Move back so Jake won't hear me. Judy turned and glanced at Steve. His serious expression caused her to obey without comment. Your uncle wasn't killed by an accident. He was murdered. What? Jake Bascom and a man named Charlie Peters killed him so they could take his gold mine. Oh, but, but it was Jake who wrote to me. He said I'd inherited the mine and suggested that I come here. They're going to force you to sign a paper that'll transfer the mine to them. Then they'll kill you. Oh, why didn't you tell me while I was in Dawson? I was undecided. First, I thought I'd go along with Jake's plan. When I saw you, I... Well, everything changed. I've been thinking it over. I can't let those crooks harm a girl like you. Believe me, Miss Clark, I didn't have a hand in your uncle's murder. I'm going to try to help you. How? They'll know. Keep your chin up and trust me. Oh, can't the law do anything? The mountains are spread mighty thin. Even if one did come along, he'd be alone against five men. Five? Yes. Jake, Charlie, and I work for your uncle. After his death, Jake brought in three of his pals. They're at the mine right now. Well, that makes six. And I'm not counting myself. I'm not helping those crooks. Does Jake know that? No, but he suspects that I don't like murder. He's watched me mighty close. What's all the plaver back there? Oh, oh, uh, just getting acquainted with a new boss, that's all, Jake. You cut the talk and tend to your paddling. All right. The rest of the long upstream trip was made in silence. Judy was badly frightened, but managed to regain a measure of composure by the time the canoe drew alongside a small dock near the house and gold mine. I'll step out of the boat, Steve. Can you unload those cases of can? All right. I'll help you out, Miss Judy. Oh, I can manage, thank you. There. We bought some supplies while we were in Dawson. All right, come on, Steve. Hoist those cases to the dock. I'll go to the house and get a couple of the men to carry them in. Be right back. Mr. Martin, you 
You said these killers had a way to make me sign over the gold mine to them. I'll tell you about it, Miss Judy. You see that house over there? Yes. All three of us who worked in the mine lived there with your uncle. There was an old woman named Ma Ridgely who did the cooking. I remember holding her a prisoner there. Oh. And they planned to kill her, but not until you're on hand to watch. They figured to make you sign over the gold mine with the understanding that the old woman will be spared. Oh, those, those beasts. There's the last of the cases. Now's your chance. All Bascom's out of sight. Jump into the canoe and I'll cast off. Oh, but I, I don't know how to paddle a canoe. You don't have to paddle. The current will carry you downstream all the way to Dawson. You yell when you get there. Someone will see you and get you to shore. Tell the constable what I've told you. But what about you? Those killers will know you helped me escape. Don't worry about me. Get in there and lie low. Oh, all right. I... <laughs> oh, Jake sees you untying the rope. Here you go. Hey, boy. Caught in the current, the canoe moved downstream while Jake, Charlie, and the three other men came running from the house a hundred yards back from the dock. White with fright, Judy lay in the bottom of the canoe but raised her head above the gunwale. She saw Steve Martin struggling with the men on shore. Rifles cracked and bullets struck the water close to the canoe. Then one shot hit the boat beneath the waterline. The canoe filled with water and capsized as the current swept it around a bend. The water was cold and numbing, but Judy had the presence of mind to cling to the overturned canoe. Minutes seemed like hours. Judy watched the bank slip past. Several times she tried kicking her feet in the hope of pushing the boat toward shore, but without success. She became increasingly weak and realized that at any moment she would lose her grip and sink into the water. Then there was an open space in the shrubbery that grew along the riverbank. She saw a man who wore the yellow striped trousers and the broad-brimmed hat of a Mountie. Mustering her strength, she cried out. Help! Help! Sergeant Preston and his great dog, Yukon King, saw the figure in midstream. It was late in the spring and the snow was gone, so the Mountie had left his sled in Dawson and was traveling to the barracks with his dogs. But Judy didn't see the rest of the team. She had eyes only for the one great husky fighting the current and swimming strongly to her side. Grab his harness, he'll bring you in. Let the canoe go. Grab the dog's harness. King felt a firm hand clutch his harness. On shore, he saw his master moving downstream to keep abreast. The sergeant's voice called out again. Bring her in, King. Bring her in, boy. With Judy hanging onto his harness, King swam toward shore, fighting against the current that carried him downstream. When he neared the edge of the river, Sergeant Preston waded in to help. That's it, King. Good work, boy. I'll take over, fella. <laughs> Easy now, miss. That's it. Thank goodness I'm ashore. You all right? Yes, I... I can stand if you... You want to help me get to my feet? I think you can walk upstream as far as my camp. I, I'm all right. I, I'm just cold. I'll build a fire as soon as we reach camp. Come along, King. Oh, oh that, that wonderful dog. He, he saved my life. Sure you're able to walk. Yes, I I don't think I could have hung on to that canoe much longer. If, is it far to Dawson? It's a very long way if you're waiting for the current to take you there. Oh, then it's lucky I saw you. Lucky for me, you you are a Mountie, aren't you? Yes, the name's Preston, Sergeant Preston. Oh, it, it's so cold. I, Steady. They, they were shooting at me. They, they hit the canoe. Don't try to talk now. It filled, filled with water. Capsized like... I, oh. <laughs> oh, she's fainted. Has to carry her to camp. In his camp, Sergeant Preston wrapped the girl in warm blankets and built a fire. Meanwhile, Judy had regained consciousness, and her strength rapidly returned as she sipped hot tea. She watched admiringly while the Mountie went to work with his keen-edged axe on the low boughs of evergreens. With skill that came from much experience, he made a small lean-to where Judy could remove her outer garments that they might dry by the fire while she remained wrapped in blankets. Now, while your clothes are drying, we'll talk. You're new to this country, aren't you? How did you know? Your clothing's new, and it was purchased in the States. Is your name Judith Clark? Why, how did you know that? I heard that you were coming from the States to take possession of your uncle's gold mine. Did you know my uncle? Slightly. I met him in town a few times, and I saw him once at his gold claim. Then you knew that he... he was killed a few weeks ago. 
Trapped in a cave-in, wasn't he? No, Sergeant Preston. He was murdered. Murdered? Yes. You sure of that? I'm sure the man who told me would have no cause to lie. Who told you? His name is Martin. A man named Martin worked at the gold mine. Yes, and there were two others, Jake Bascom and Charlie Peters. Martin said Jake and Peters killed my uncle. They intend to steal a gold mine, but they must have my signature before they can have legal possession. Judy continued to sip hot tea as she told about her arrival in Dawson, the trip upstream, and her escape with the help of Steve Martin. When she finished, the Mountie said, According to your story, those crooks don't know whether you're alive or dead. But they know they struck the canoe with a bullet. If they think you drowned, they'll probably murder Mrs. Ridgely. Oh, I, I hadn't thought of that. They said they intended to use her to force you to sign over the gold mine. And that's what Steve Martin told me. If Bascom knows you're dead, he'll probably forge your name. Oh, but he can't be sure I'm dead. He may have one of his gang follow the river to find out. Miss Clark, you'll be able to keep warm and comfortable in that lean-to... Enough firewood's cut to last several hours. King and the other dogs will protect you, and as an extra measure, I'll leave my carbine with you. What are you going to do? I'm going to your uncle's house. Oh, but you can't go there alone. There are five killers in that house. There's no one to go with me. Can't you get help from Dawson? Why, no, Miss Clark. You see, you drifted only a couple of miles downstream before I saw you. It's just a short distance to the gold mine, but it's a long way to Dawson. And with Mrs. Risley's life at stake, I can't take the time here, King. <laughs> I'm going to leave you here on guard, boy. Take care of the girl, King. <laughs> Miss Clark, leave the other dogs fastened to the lion. Sergeant Preston, if you must meet those killers, at least take your rifle. You may need it more than I. If there's gunplay, my six gun will be handier than the rifle. Keep the fire going and depend on King. <laughs> Sorry, fella, but you can't go. You need it here. See you later, King. Suddenly, King's manner changed. He caught the scent of a man in the gentle breeze that swept downstream. And to King, a man's scent conveyed friendship fear, or treachery. King stood rigid with his nose pointing toward one of the many thickets of underbrush that grew along the bank of the stream. He tried to tell of the danger lurking there. Why does King act like that, Sergeant? What is it, fellow? Someone trying to sneak up on us? King, you stay right there. <laughs> King, I said stay. King stood motionless while Sergeant Preston walked casually away from the camp. He angled away from the river and then turned and moved toward the thicket to which King still pointed. When in position to protect the dog, the Mountie called out sharply, Take him, King! King leaped ahead, charging straight toward the thicket where he knew the enemy was hiding. The outlaw, seeing the dog advance, rose from the ground to fire. Sergeant Preston saw him and fired first. Oh, my hand! You'll want it, gunplay. My hand is busted! King leaped around the bush and closed with Charlie Peters. Oh, no, look out! Call off the dog. Take him away. Help me, I tell you. That'll do, King. What's the idea? Why'd you shoot me? That's only a flesh wound. I fired to disarm you before you killed my dog. Oh, no, I Isn't was... your name Charlie Peters? What of it? You work with Martin and Bascom. You sneaked along the river bank, keeping behind the shrubs. Why? Uh, nothing. I only... You came downstream to learn whether or not Miss Clark still lived. Now listen, Sergeant. Hold still while I put these handcuffs oh, on you. You can't arrest me. I've done nothing wrong. There's a charge of murder against you, Peters. Taking you in custody until I learn more about it. Oh. That'll hold you for the time being. Now listen, Sergeant. I was looking for the girl, like you said. We were downright worried about her. Maybe she told you how the canoe slipped away from the dock with her in it. She told me a lot of things, one of which was the way you put a bullet through the canoe. Oh, that's all wrong. Peters, but... if you were on the level, there'd be no reason for you to sneak along the riverbank, keeping out of sight behind the brushwood. Now hold still while I bandage your hand. Uh, what are you going to do with me? I'm taking you with me while I go to the Clark Mine and talk to Bascom, Martin, and Mrs. Ridgely. It was the season of increasingly long days and short nights. Sergeant Preston set out with his prisoner in the gathering dusk, leaving King and the other dogs with Judy Clark. He forced Charlie Peters to walk ahead on the trail upstream. You may as well understand your position, Peters. When we get close to the Clark cabin, they intend to gag you and tie you to a tree while I talk to Bascom and his pals. Uh, you got me all wrong, Sergeant Preston. I've done nothing wrong. Uh -huh. And if that's true, you have nothing to worry about. Now keep going. Meanwhile, inside the house where Clark had lived with his men, Bascom sat at a table. Steve Martin and Ma Ridgely sat tied to crude chairs in one corner. There were three other men in the room, three killers, friends for whom Bascom had sent soon after the death of Dan Clark. 
Well, how long are we going to sit around like this, Bascom? Why don't we get rid of these two and be done with it? That's what I'd like to know. You might just as well kill me now as later. Well, take it easy, Mrs. Ridgely. Maybe we won't have to kill you. Maybe Charlie Peters will bring the girl back here alive. And if she signs over the property to me, I'll let you go. That's a lie, Bascom. You'll have to kill me and Judy Clark as well. You wouldn't dare let either of us go, because you know I'll tell the law how you killed Clark. <laughs> I didn't kill him. He was caught when his tunnel caved in. A tunnel <laughs> caved in because you weakened the timbers so they collapsed as soon as Clark fired blasting powder. The law oh. would have a hard time proving that. I'm not afraid of the law. You better be afraid of the law, Jake. You shut up, Steve. You already talked too much. If you hadn't double-crossed me to help that girl escape, you wouldn't be where you are right now. Bascom, I'm just praying I'll have a chance to tell the law about you. The law won't get here. There'll be law if Judy Clark gets to Dawson. Don't count on any law, Martin. That girl was hanging to a water-filled canoe on midstream. She can't last until the current carries her to Dawson. Before that, she'll go numb with cold, lose her grip, and drown. Ah, uh, we're wasting time, waiting for Peters to bring her back alive. Well, you can't tell. She might have been washed ashore somewhere downstream. Mighty little chance of that. Jake, if she's dead, how can we get the property? Uh, same way we'll get it if she refuses to sign it over. I'll forge her name. I'd uh, rather have her genuine signature on the paper, but uh, I'll forge it as a last resort. Uh, yeah, well, you're the boss. Glad you recognize that. Well, boys, there's no use of all of us staying awake all night waiting for Charlie to get back. Two of us can stand watch while the other two get some sleep. Lefty, you and Hank turn in. Me and Joel stand watch for four hours, and then we'll uh, call you so you can take your turn. Right. 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 Let's... All right. Let's... Steve, they'll kill both of us, won't they? I reckon so, Ma Ridgely. Kill us the same way they killed Dan Clark, so it'll look like an accident. If Peters brings back Judy, she'll die with us after she assigns her property to Bascom. Oh, I'm glad you didn't go along with their murder plan, Steve. He thought Dan's death was really an accident until a couple of days ago when Jake was boasting. I didn't have a hand in it. Oh, I'm glad, Steve. Glad your conscience is clear. King felt that he'd been left out of important business when Sergeant Preston left camp with his prisoner. For some time, he lay quietly on the ground. His ears were alert and his eyes wide open while his nose rested on his front paws. From time to time, he glanced toward the girl seated just inside the lean-to near the fire. Presently, a feeling of uneasiness swept over King. Some sixth sense told the dog that he should be at the side of his master. He began to whimper softly. Then he rose to his feet and started pacing the length of rope to which the dogs of the team were tied at intervals. The other dogs caught King's mood. One or two raised a voice in protest at restraint. The others joined in. Quiet, quiet, King. Quiet, all of you. Hey, what's the matter with you fellows? King gripped the girl's skirt in his teeth and tugged gently in an effort to tell her that he and his teammates should follow their master's trail. No, no, King, stop that. Lie down and be still. Instead of obeying, King trotted to one end of the rope to which the dogs were fastened. He pulled on the knot that then looked up at Judy. Then he repeated the performance. More than ever now, he felt that Sergeant Preston needed help. Finally, the girl shrugged her shoulders and said, All right, King, I'll release them. Judy could no longer ignore King's plea. She released each dog in turn, okay. while King leaped and barked there instructions to his mates. After Peters had been gagged and tied to a tree, Sergeant Preston moved toward the cabin. He knew better than to count on help from Steve Martin. Steve might have been killed. At best, he would be a prisoner. The Mountie decided on a stratagem that he hoped would give him the upper hand. Loosening his gun in its holster, he rapped on the door, then stepped back. Inside the cabin, Bascom and the others grew tense. One said, Hey, you suppose that's Charlie Peters? No, Charlie wouldn't rap. Well, then who is it? Hold your guns ready, I'll find out. Yeah, who is it? 
Step outside, Bascom. Well, who are you? I have news about Charlie Peters. Hey, did you hear that? Mm. Open the door and walk in. I must speak to you about here, privately. What do you make of it, Bascom? You suppose that girl could reach Dawson? Sent a lawman up this way? I don't see how, but I'm taking no chances. Lefty, you go out the back way through the woodshed. Then circle the house so you can cover the man outside. He'll make it fast. Get going. Right. You're coming out? Yeah, I'll be right there. You two boys stand over there behind Steve Martin and Maura Ridgely. Right. They try to make an outcry, wrap him on the head. Sure, on, Hank. Let's go. Then I'll see what that critter wants. Hey, where you? For a moment, yes. Jake saw no one. Sergeant Preston was standing in the darkness, away from the light that spilled through the open door. Over here. Hey. Oh, I didn't see you. Well, speak up fast, mister. Tell me what you want. A money. Yes, Baskin. The name's Sergeant Preston. Keep your voice low. What do you want? I'm investigating the death of Dan Clark. I'll take that gun. Well, you got it. I know you have a few men inside the house. You're to walk through that door ahead of me. If anyone starts gunplay, you'll be in the way of bullets. Oh, now, see here, Marty. There's no call to treat me like a murderer. With the odds against me, I take no chances. Get your hands up, Marty. All right. <laughs> Good work, Lefty. Now, I'll take back my gun, Preston. And likewise, yours. There. Now we go inside. That's where you wanted to be, isn't it? That's right, Baskin, but... I don't care to go inside while you two have the drop on me. I'd rather have it out right here. Oh, are you? As a desperate measure, Sergeant Preston ducked to one side and jabbed a hard fist into Jake's stomach. He caught both outlaws off balance, but his advantage was only momentary. Don't put a bullet in him and take him alive. Right. Grab his arms. The two remaining outlaws rushed from the house to end what small chance Sergeant Preston had to conquer Jake and Lefty. A smashing blow caught the Mountie on the chin. That did it. Sergeant Preston was dazed and limp, but not unconscious. He staggered and would have fallen, but for the support of the men who held his arms. Through the open doorway, he could see Steve Martin and Ma Ridgely tied to chairs. And he heard Jake Bascom saying, uh, You two fellas go inside and drag Ma and Steve into the kitchen. I don't want them to tell too much to the money. Hi, Jake. <laughs> That you was smart, eh, Muddy? If I don't get you, Bascom, someone else will. Boss, I don't like to have a hand in the murder of a Mountie. There'll be no murder. It'll just be another tunnel cave in. Just another accident. You won't get away with it, Bascom. Miss Clark knows how her uncle died. It... She's alive, eh? You met her. That's what brought you here. Yes, she's alive and well guarded. What's her word against the word of all of us? Take him inside, boys. We'll tie him and move all three to the cave. Come on, Mountie. <laughs> Wait a minute, boss. Uh, Was that a dog? A uh, dog and wolf, I can't be sure. What's the difference? Sergeant Preston recognized the deep-throated voice of the great dog, Yukon King. His strength was returning rapidly. And though his brain was clear, he couldn't understand why King had left the camp. He wished there was some way to turn back the dog, who would have no chance against four armed men. Come inside, Lefty, and close the door. Dog or wolf, whatever the critter is, he's coming closer. Coming from the other side of the house. Well, stand there and watch for him if you want to. There he is! Standing just outside the door, Lefty saw the great dog leap into view around the corner of the house. He fired once, but he fired too fast. His bullet went high. King leaped and knocked him sprawling. Oh, no. Then King was through the door, but he was not alone. The other dogs were right behind. Oh, shoot them, watcher! Hey, get him, watcher! Get the dog! The room was filled with powerful huskies, leaping and dodging as they attacked the men who tried to bring their guns to bear. Take them, boys! Take them! There were scattered shots. One dog was hit, but the others quickly closed in. Jake momentarily broke loose. He had dropped his own gun, but now he snatched the Mountie's weapon from his belt as Sergeant Preston leaped forward. Oh, no, you don't, Jake! He put all his strength into a smashing blow to the killer's jaw. Jake went down. Preston reclaimed his gun and held it ready, but the fight was over. The dogs had done their work. The outlaws lay flat on the floor, disarmed and wild-eyed with panic as they stared at the threatening fangs so close to their throats. That's all, boys. Quiet, King. Quiet, all of you. You men, stand up. The dogs won't hurt you unless you resist. Line up over there and face the wall. You too, Jake. Preston held his gun in readiness and kept a sharp watch on the outlaws as he opened the kitchen door. 
Behind his back, he heard Steve speak. Look, Ma Ridgely, he's captured all the crooks. I have a knife, Martin. I'll cut that rope around your wrists. Oh, just free my hands. I'll take care of the rest. Good. Sergeant, you have four of the crooks, but there's another one. His name's Charlie Peters. He's already a prisoner, Mrs. Ridgely. I'm taking him and Baskin in for murder, and the others for attempted murder. Your hands are free, Steve. Oh, thanks, Sergeant. Save the ropes to tie the prisoner's hands. I'll keep them covered. Steve Martin tied the hands of Jake and his three companions and then held a gun on them while Sergeant Preston examined the wounded dog. Just a flesh wound, boy. You'll be all right. I'll put a dressing on that and we have more time. Good dog. The wounded dog and King remained in the house while the rest were turned out of doors. Preston brought Charlie Peters from the tree where he had tied him. And as he entered the house, he heard the voice of Judy Clark. Sergeant Preston! Sergeant Preston! Miss Clark! Come in and close the door. Oh, Miss Judy, thank goodness you're alive. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I'm all right. Why, you've captured them all. I don't know why you and the dogs left camp, but I'm awfully glad you did. It, it was King's idea. He, he tried to tell me to untie the dogs, and, and when I didn't, he chewed the rope that held them. They came here, and well, there was nothing for me to do but follow. King, I told you to stay with the girl. <laughs> oh, sakes alive, don't scold him. If he hadn't brought his pals here, we'd all have died. I'll not scold him, Mrs. Ridgely. He doesn't often disobey. And when he does, it's generally for the best. <laughs> Good work, King. You've done your part, boy. I'll take these crooks to Dawson, and this case will be closed. <laughs> In our next adventure, as the sergeant and king climbed through the open window into the darkened bedroom, two outlaws could be heard in the adjoining room of the cabin. Oh, there's no gold dust under the floor. Have you looked through all the cupboards? Yeah. There's nothing here. Must be the bedroom. Let's see. <laughs> Quiet, king. One more killing doesn't mean anything to those two. Here they come. Sergeant Preston! <laughs> A desperate gun battle at close range. And the sergeant is matched with two men who are already wanted for murder and determined to fight to the death. Don't miss this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, and directed by Fred Flowerday. Today's adventure was written by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. The Challenge of the Yukon is brought to you every Saturday and Sunday. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next adventure. This program came from Detroit. Today's most popular heroes of outdoor adventure are heard every weekday afternoon from 5 to 6 o'clock. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Mark Trail roams the wilderness, Clyde Beatty defies the beasts of the jungle, and Victor Borga entertains with five minutes of musical laughs. Tuesday and Thursday, there are the Indian hero Straight Arrow riding to uphold justice, Sky King zooming the supersonic action, and Bobby Benson, the cowboy kid, in tales of western daring. Listen to Mutual's Hour for Fun with Mark Trail, Clyde Beatty, Victor Borga, Straight Arrow, Sky King, and Bobby Benson over most of these stations every weekday afternoon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.